truly, if you close your eyes and just think about where there is a highway, um, what you will see is a tale of two cities. Hello, everyone. This is Barbara Humpton, CEO of Siemens USA, and thanks for listening to The Optimistic Outlook. Before we get into today's episode, I want us to do a quick visualization. Okay, so picture yourself in your favorite city. Maybe you're on a walk through your favorite neighborhood or you're eating at your favorite restaurant. Now, imagine being in this moment and learning about plans underway to repurpose the space you're in to build a highway through it. (laughs) You might first be like, wait a minute, this has to be a hoax. But you know what? As the interstate highway system came of age in the 1960s and 70s, this was a frequent occurrence. And you'll hear my guest today hearken back to this time in 1956 as the planning began. Where I live in Washington, D.C., many of our most vibrant neighborhoods would have been wiped off the map by a highway project proposed in 1969. But the project didn't happen. But unfortunately, around the country, many such projects did go forward, creating division and inequality still felt today. My guest today, Stephanie Gidaby Jenkins, captured much of this history in an op-ed she wrote for Politico in 2020. We'll link to it in our show notes. And I want to call out just one line from the piece that really struck me. Stephanie wrote, if transportation has been the engine of unfairness, it's also true that transportation can and should be part of the solution. And so that's what we're going to explore on the podcast today. We're going to learn some lessons from our past and think about how we can chart more equitable approaches as we support the bipartisan infrastructure law. Stephanie is founder and co-partner of North Star Strategies, and you'll hear her tell about her most recent venture. She also draws from previous experiences at the U.S. Department of Transportation, in state and local government, and in the U.S. House of Representatives. I hope you benefit as much as I did from this conversation. Take a listen. Stephanie, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thank you, Barbara. We at Siemens were active in the conversation leading to the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I'll mention just a couple of the things that we were pleased about. One was an approach that went well beyond bridges and roads. And second was a level of investment that really enables us to go beyond maintaining what we already have in place. You know, under the law, we can really build for the next century of American growth and leadership. In fact, We know that this law puts forward the largest long-term investments in our infrastructure in nearly a century. But with that also comes a responsibility, and we need to ensure that what we build advances a more sustainable, equitable, resilient future. And, you know, with infrastructure, we might think that those things happen automatically, yet history shows us otherwise. What's the legacy of the infrastructure we built in the past? When we were building our infrastructure uh, um, almost 65 years ago uh, this year, uh, it was a different America in 1956. More specifically, we intentionally divided our communities in places based off of race and in many places off of class. The other piece that was happening was that there was a legacy in which public input in the process was also going through its own uh, evolution in the process. Uh, Many people may not be familiar with the National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, but that also was a moment in time in the early and late 60s where folks really started to have a conversation about the role that government should be playing um, in in ensuring that they are engaging community in a more intentional way. And in many ways, when we look to this moment in time, there's an opportunity for us to engage very differently and across the country in places like Rondo um, in the St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis corridor, Twin Cities area. And I too share a level of excitement that we now have a time and an opportunity to reimagine an infrastructure system that ensures that we all thrive. And so it's really powerful in this moment to really think about what that looks like and how we can really build for tomorrow. 
Stephanie, as that early infrastructure, the interstate system was being built, it actually did change the nature of how we interact with cities. Tell me more about that. Truly, if you close your eyes and just think about where there is a highway, um, what you will see is a tale of two cities in that in that community. And it's not limited just to an urban context. Even within areas that are rural um, across our country, you will see that the places that were actually designed and allocated to be the exits and on-ramps and off-ramps also limited economic development and opportunity. Um, the, the corridors in which uh, folks may have been able to travel the back roads to get to uh, simply became off ramp and, and not necessarily part of the economic engine of a region. This is the optimistic outlook and optimism, you know, needs to really um, not fear the negative realities that we've dealt with in the past, but, but face those with clear eyes to really accept the hard truths and wrap our heads around them. But it's essential that we do and that we face them directly. Can you share with us an example of how a community worked to undo the damage caused by some of the harmful infrastructure decisions of the past? I-94 is going through a reimagining process uh, with the state DOT and the county uh, to really think about how to invest in a neighborhood that was divided um, and took out in a historically Black African-American community uh, during that time and era. And now really thinking about how we build back in a very different way. You can see a similar conversation happening um, in the Vine Street Expressway in Philadelphia. Uh, there was the the, the woman who comes to me is uh, Mrs. Cecilia. She was a librarian and she was a staunch advocate who uh, very much fought uh, as the interstate was going to go through her community. And, and while it did take out a predominantly Asian neighborhood and community, there is new talks about how to really think about how to invest very differently. Um, and these are just some ways to daylight that this infrastructure that we talk about is not just about passing through a neighborhood, but it's being able to acknowledge place and that people live there. And imagine what it would look like to have the level of investment that essentially really calls out um, and also calls in an opportunity for people to visit the places that we all enjoy in many ways. So another issue that's top of mind for Siemens is sustainability and air quality a topic we addressed in an earlier episode of The Optimistic Outlook. What's the legacy of our infrastructure in terms of environmental outcomes? Yeah, so one of the pieces that we know is the cumulative impacts. While I talked about the fact that you can see the legacy of our infrastructure decisions in communities across the country, the other piece that you can see is the impact on air quality, um, quality of life for residents who live along those highway systems, in part because of what we call the tailpipe pollutions. The fact that uh, the, the, the levels of folks who are now driving back into our downtown regions throughout our communities are uh, of significant numbers, in part because we require a car in many places across the country because there aren't transportation options uh, like public transit made available for people to have different choices. And so that level of what we call congestion, the immense number of cars and trucks on the roads also means that there is high pollution standards. And that means that the air that residents are breathing in those neighborhoods and in those communities create a long-term effect for asthma rates for young people. It means that there are chronic uh, issues in terms of their health. And it's one of those things that you don't think about when you decide that you may want to live in a community near a highway or not. In many ways, uh, many of these neighborhoods they didn't necessarily choose to live next to a highway. It was built there. Um, and it, it, it was not their choice or their voice wasn't honored in the public process. And so as a result, they now have to live with a chronic legacy of place. One of the communities that comes to mind for me um, is in the Gulf South, where uh, we call uh, Cancer Alley in New Orleans area. Uh, and you can see that along the Mississippi River, that there are communities that have been 
disproportionately impacted by high rates of cancer, uh, high, high rates of chronic health conditions, in part because of the air quality of the community um, caused by potentially the chemical plants in those neighborhoods, but also the freight traffic that may be coming in and out of a plant. And uh, in places like LA, you see a lot of that conversation happening around the ports. And me recent laws have now ensured that there are standards by the vehicle producers in terms of manufacturing um, for the air, air quality that is required for a neighborhood and being able to measure those pieces to really ensure that just because you live in a specific neighborhood doesn't mean that you have to uh, die as a result of that. I'll say one more piece, which is that what we know is that your zip code has more of a social determining outcome of your life expectancy than your genetic code. So that means that regardless of uh, you know, who your mother or father may have been and what health conditions your parent, your grandparents or great grandparents had, where you live matters. And in places across the country, particularly uh, black and brown indigenous spaces, uh, what we see is that that impact of place has a long term determining factor of how long someone can live. And we now have an opportunity to do something different. So I'm excited again by the possibilities of how we invest in place differently, how we think about both what we're investing, how we're addressing and redressing those past decisions to ensure we all thrive. I'd love to hear if there are any communities that are doing things that you think break this model. Can you tell us about any projects that would be an inspiration to other communities across the country? You know, again, I, I uplifted L.A. in part not because of the challenges that were happening there, but also because of a long legacy of environmental justice leaders who really fought um, in their state houses to ensure that there were passages of laws that ensured that those who lived along um, the ports, the port of LA, the port of Long Beach, that there would be significant air quality standards and that um, there would be additional resources made available to ensure that not only were there transportation options, but that there were other uh, uh, investments in those communities to ensure that the cumulative impacts of living near um, these multimodal areas and systems uh, would not negatively impact residents who have been there for some time. That's a, a great example that local advocacy can really be a game changer. And there are resources available. But let's think a little more big picture about how we chart a different path forward. I'm interested to get your thoughts on how the bipartisan infrastructure law will have a positive impact and can help us shape the future we want. This is an economic development opportunity to really think about how we reconnect our neighborhoods and our, and our neighbors and our communities in a more intentional way. One of the things that is in the bill that I am very excited about is the Reconnecting Communities Grant, which will actually be announced this summer uh, by the Federal Highways Administration. And during my time at the U.S. Department of Transportation, we had an opportunity to uh, participate in something called the Every Place Counts Design Challenge, where we traveled across the country um, in places like Nashville and Spokane, Washington, to really, in addition to many Minneapolis and Philadelphia to really reimagine what it would look like to have new systems, highway systems that connect communities. You can see other examples that may not necessarily be about reinforcing the physical infrastructure, but remembering place. Um, and so in Ohio, there's a beautiful bridge, the Long Bridge, that uh, really tells the story of the residents who lived in that community in, in, in years past. And one thing that I will note is that in many ways, there is a formula in which dollars are distributed to states and local regions and municipalities at the most local level. And that formula funding has really defined how we've invested in our physical assets. 
But there have been greater flexibility created by the law that offers more options for folks to really think about how to embed resiliency and how to embed equity priorities in the levels of investments. What Congress didn't do was ensure that there were standards put in place so that every state would have a baseline in which they would have to operate from to ensure that equity and and, and, and addressing climate was part of the priority. So that means that there has to be, in many ways, a 50-state strategy, that the governors who are going to receive a lot of these resources and the people that they have designated to help to support the implementation are really centering equity, are elevating and ensuring that resiliency is part of the discussion. What I'll say as an everyday environmentalist is that for as much as we may uh, not always agree as to how climate change has happened and what is the cause of it, what we know is that we're being impacted by it. The weather is changing, the extreme nature of it, the wildfires that we saw throughout the last few years, the extreme hurricanes that have taken out both the physical assets and human lives really speaks to the fact that we have to make different investments. And if we are going to truly leverage this $1.2 trillion that has been awarded by Congress, we also have to ensure that they can last for the long term and can adjust and, and really um, be resilient to the extreme weathers that we're facing today. Because it would be a shame that we would build all of these pieces only for them to be washed away. So I really do hope that those who are listening are, are thinking about how to ensure that our investments that we're making are for the long term and that we are incorporating uh, climate change, that we are thinking about the social impacts and who is benefiting and who is being burdened by the level of investments that will remain. If we don't make these intentional decisions today, what we will continue to do is reinforce the challenges that I believe 2020 really brought to light in many ways from a social, environmental, and economic reality. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on the wrong side of history. So I hope that your listeners will really think about the role that they can play to do their part at any level that they have um, power and influence to be part of the discussion. Stephanie, it's a fantastic point. And I can assure you that Siemens as a focused technology company, really, this is what we're about. We're putting our know-how in electrification, automation, digitalization to work toward these longer range goals. We know that these global megatrends are in effect. And, and so we're rising to that challenge. And we're eager to contribute to priorities like helping build microgrids that'll make us more resilient in to, to weather damage. We're working on the transformation into clean power for transportation so that there is less pollution of our congested cities. Uh, just trying to bring more rail transit because it's gonna be more efficient. I'm so excited about what we're gonna be doing in the overall electric vehicle transformation where personal vehicles now become cleaner. All of that is gonna to contribute to this future future and being on the right side of history. That's a great way to think about it. I'm wondering though, as well as uh, the impact of the decision-making process on this project design stage, you've highlighted in interviews and op-eds that siloed thinking can ha has been a hindrance in the past. And I'm wondering what advice you have for technologists like us about how we can partner more effectively, not only with governments, but with an array of stakeholders in different places. Thank you for that. And thank you for your work, honestly, in many ways, uh, both to the Seaman leadership, but also to the employees who are doing um, the everyday uh, ch change making that is required in meeting this moment. And I'm encouraged in part for the scale in which innovation is happening. Uh, we've got folks who are thinking at a completely different level for the ways in which our future may be. During my tenure at USDOT, we had an opportunity to work on something called the Smart Cities Challenge. 
And what really uh, changed the way that the projects really came to completion for many of the finalists was when we really started to think about who we were designing for and who had been most impacted in the past by those decisions. We really centered the challenges of equity, of climate, um, and the importance of resiliency in the building of uh, the areas that we were talking about. And as you talk about the microgrids and the opportunity, even for what we're many leaders in the field on the justice side are calling energy democracy, it's an opportunity to really think about how we bring in community solar as part of the conversation. I know that there's been work in the Bronzeville neighborhood of Chicago, and you all have been part of those discussions. There have also been discussions about what does a People's Utilities Commission look like? How do we ensure that we are really being part of the discussion about our energy choices so that we can have more options on the table? Table, that create better jobs, that create greater opportunities, um, and also really ensure a better quality of life. There are really also great jobs that are going to come from this, uh, both the investment and also the innovation that we're talking about. When we talk about innovation, though, remember, oftentimes it's built off of the legacy of something else. So if we don't name what we're trying to solve for and really also identify the challenges of those innovations, particularly by those who have been most impacted negatively, what we may be doing is reinforcing harm. So I would really push again to your listeners to really think about how is my investment maybe negatively hit impacting a specific group and invite them into the space. Um, oftentimes, and I think in the last few years, there has been a very much of a call out, right? Naming people, saying when things are wrong, and that is important. But I think that this is also a call-in opportunity and inviting people into the discussions and conversations that are happening that may traditionally not necessarily speak together um, or necessarily co-collaborate together. I think the work that's happening at the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy around EV and um, electric vehicle infrastructure is one of those examples. I think the conversation around housing and transportation and transit options more specifically, you talked about rail and the investment that you all are doing, that is going to have a significant impact on how places are going to be invested in. And in many ways, it also means that there may be a reality of people being displaced. And so how do we also have a conversation to ensure both investment without displacement? How do we make sure that the infrastructure that we're building ensures that those who are living there get to enjoy those investments for today and tomorrow. These are all just um, a few of the opportunities that happen when you all invite new voices into the table to talk about the opportunities that can be presented in meeting this moment. Stephanie, I really appreciated reading your 2020 op-ed in Politico. And you point out that actually much of the civil rights movement was actually centered on transportation systems. Yeah, share with our audience a bit of your view of the nexus of transportation and equity. I don't think most people think about transportation as a civil rights issue, but it truly is. Um, at, you know, as I started the conversation, what I talked about was the fact that we had separate and unequal policies, but in part it comes from the legacy of Ferguson, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson uh, in New Orleans uh, and the decision where there could be separate train cars, right? Um, and that as long as they were equal, it was acceptable. But what we learned was that separate does not often equal um, an opportunity for the same level of investment and resources. And so across the country, you see those pieces play itself out. You you see the divide that continued to happen when we think about uh, Rosa Parks and we talk about her legacy. It was that decision to say, I am not going to sit on the back of a bus any longer, right? That we wanted access to public transit for those who, uh, you know, rely on a bus service, the reliability at times is not the same as heavy rail or transit. Um, you can expect that your train will show up at a specific time. That's not always the case for a bus service, right? And so as you continue to see the conversations evolve, you also see where transformation happens. So we talk about even going further back. 
I sometimes reference the notion of um, the Underground Railroad and that in many ways, that legacy of place in transportation started even as a place towards freedom. Right. It was an imaginary thought process, but that there was a pathway that was brought forward for folks to travel. And transportation continues even now in this moment to create a potential new pathway for us to build a different America. And you see that in the freedom rides that would come in the summers of the 1960s, where young people from the North went to the South to try to desegregate uh, many of the places along the Southern region. This is just a portion of the opportunity that I see that transportation gets to play. That while it may have been the impetus for our challenges, it also is the bridging of the possibilities. And so I am deeply encouraged, again, by the level of investment that has been made because we do have an opportunity to do something transformationally different. One of the benefits that's come out of the disruption over the last couple of years is this rise of virtual communication. Within Siemens, we've learned to do a better job using virtual tools so that we can connect our experts all over the world to the customers who need their know-how. Is there an opportunity here, say, through virtual meetings to bring more people into the process to better influence our infrastructure decisions? I mean, I think about a couple raising children. Uh, They might not be able to make a 6 p.m. planning meeting that the local community has set up, but maybe they could log in and listen while they're making dinner for the kids. Um, Do we need more of a call to action at this moment to get people more engaged in the process? We fully need more people involved in the process um, and meeting this moment. And I would say that this moment is more than a moment. It's really an opportunity to create a new movement, a movement to really engage in democracy and de- engage in um, our, our future, um, to really build in a way that really reflects both the opportunities for today and also for the next generation. I'm going to bring my whole self into this conversation, which is that I'm a new mom. And when I thought about one of the reasons why I had to return back to work, it was to really be part of this discussion in this moment. What I will say is that for as much as many of us who've been living within the Beltway in Washington, D.C., have been advocating for infrastructure, I'm not sure that we were fully prepared to receive both the dollars and also the coordination that's required. And so one of the things that I am currently working on is an infrastructure alliance that will really bring together equity-centered leadership, uh, TA, national thought leaders, advocacy groups, to really engage in a very different way on coordination. We are all going to have to do our parts at every scale of government, whether it's the federal, state, or local, but also as residents. It's going to be important for us to participate in the planning discussions and the visioning that will be happening in our regions. One of the greater opportunities that I had to that I had the opportunity to participate over the last few years is to serve on the regional uh, transit agency WMATA uh, for DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And what I will say is that we had to figure out how to really invest Uh, both the resources, but our outreach in a very different way to get to residents. We know that um, not every worker had the opportunity to stay at home. And so it meant that we had to think about our transit system and the outreach that needed to happen to those who are most affected in a very different way. And so as you talked about the realities of being able to have more virtual sessions, having more inclusive dialogue, uh, really changing our stakeholder engagement model and our community engagement models to ensure that everyone can participate in the conversations. This was just some of the great benefits that actually did come out of COVID because it forced us to do business in a very different way. And I'm encouraged that there is a new model for us to really engage um, folks where they are, at home, right? Um, Being able to send out uh, virtual experiences, whether through social media, um, digital engagement, new survey tools, but also sending things through the mail. And because people were home, they could actually fill out a survey in a very different way than they had in the past. So I think that this is a way to bring both things that we've always done before and also new ways um, to offer the space for us to build differently and co-create differently. Yeah, great tools for you to lead us 
in this new direction. So congratulations, first, on being a new mom, and second, on launching your new association. And and I really want to ask you, imagine 10 years into the future, and you've been wildly successful with your efforts. Describe to us the world that you'll be creating. Thank you for that question. Um, What I am imagining is not just the world that I'll be creating, but the world that we'll be creating together. And it's really an opportunity to bring together diverse voices, um, diverse perspectives to ensure that at a very local level, regardless of what side of the highway you live, you have access. You can connect to the resources that you need, that public transit, that your um, transportation options are available to you, that broadband is not limited by a digital divide, that there are greater opportunities for you to have access to clean water, um, that you are able to really support the next generation of leaders who are working at the university level, at the college level, and new jobs that really promote clean energy, that promote clean transportation systems, where the impact of pollution is no longer part of this conversation, that air quality is no longer a challenge in the same ways, and that businesses are able to really thrive from a wealth creation, regardless of your race or your gender, um, and that There is an intergenerational uh, communication opportunity that whether you're younger or older, um, more seasoned in the leadership of our country, uh, that there's a perspective that we want to ensure that every American, regardless of where they live, have access to the resources that they need to thrive. That is the American dream. And as you were describing that, I was thinking about my grandchildren and I, I want to live in that world and I want them to live in that world. Thank you for the optimism. And what I will, one of the things that I'll say is that um, I too am an optimist. So it was, it was great to be on the optimist podcast. (laughs) And, um, you know, for me, the other thing that I may bring into the space is that um, optimism um, also, um, if not grounded with some level of intentionality, just offers us a space to be indifferent. We can just feel like things will be okay. And um, one of my favorite quotes is um, MLK talks about the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. And so that means it requires us to be arc benders. It requires us to do our work and our our, our jobs very differently and intentionally because the system in many ways is set up um, automatically to continue to do what it's always done. And as I started the conversation, it was intended to divide us by race, by class. So unless we have folks who are choosing to intentionally be arc benders, we're going to continue to have what we've always had. And intent with optimism versus intentionality with optimism are two different things. So I appreciate the intentionality that you've offered in giving me a platform to talk about the work. And I hope that this intent goes beyond that, that you all will continue to think about how to ensure that places continue to thrive. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Stephanie's insights really put in perspective for me the opportunities we have in rolling out the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I'll say, too, that I'm proud of what Siemens can bring to the table. Reinventing energy grids, helping accelerate a future of mobility that's electric and connected, strengthening rail connections, embracing digital tools that shorten supply chains and launch new careers in manufacturing. These are just some of the ways that Siemens is ready to help transform America's infrastructure. So head over now to our show notes for more resources. And as always, I thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform or to the Siemens YouTube channel. And for show notes and more, go to Siemens.com optimist.